Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, Why is America in Asia? And joining us is today's guest, Peter C. Olison, a former Pentagon and CIA analyst who uh, specializes in intelligence and is widely published in that area. Welcome to Asian Review. Thank you, Bill. Nice to be here. It's great to have you. Well, let's get right into it. Um, what is America's position in, in the world today? Well, you know, ever since the Second World War, the United States has been the principal world power. Uh, it really got to that because of the devastation of so many other nations. So there really was no competitive power in the period initially following uh, the Second World War. Of course, with the rebuilding of Europe, the rebuilding of, of Japan and Asia, uh, the growth in China, uh, the relative uh, power of the United States to other nations is less than what, what it was, although the U.S. clearly remains the most powerful nation you know, on the planet. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, geopolitical trends always continue and they always change. Uh, there's nothing that's permanent, so you would expect to have a change. And I think what we've seen in the last decade or two with the United States is that uh, there are competing economic powers, uh, especially with the growth of the economy in China. Uh, but also elsewhere in the European Union, so that the United States may be, you know, the first among equals, but it's more that than it is the dominant hegemon. Mm. Do you see other countries uh, beginning to form alliances with other countries that don't necessarily go uh, accord with U.S. interests? Oh, oh, clearly, and, and I think one has to expect that. Uh, you know, every nation state will pursue its own uh, critical interests. Um, and in the past, of course, many of them have uh, been reluctant to, shall I say, go against the interests of the United States because of different types of dependency. You know, whether that was in a military uh, alliance or whether it was economic. But as that evolves, uh, they look to what are their best interests. And frankly, and you see it in the Asia Pacific area, I right. think more so than any place else, that the countries that make up this area are finding that what they need to do is talk to one another and do things in their, in their own interests, which may be not totally uh, in concert with what the U.S. would like. I think, you know, a, a good example clearly is in the uh, South China Sea area, mm. uh, you know, where some countries have, you know, are resisting uh, Chinese encroachment on their territorial waters and economic zones, Indonesia being a good example, you know, which has seized Chinese fishing vessels and sunk them, right, right, uh, right. you know, uh, versus uh, the Philippines, where clearly Duterte in my opinion, has been bought off by the Chinese through economic aid and <clears throat> maybe other means that we aren't quite aware of, uh, so that he's been soft-pedaling what the Chinese have done in the Scarborough Reef area, which is clearly, you know, Philippine uh, uh, territory. Right, right. Well, that, you said a lot there, and that's a, a lot of really interesting, um, you know, uh, comments there. Um, some people would say other countries... Uh, how should I say, tendency to want to form alliances with other countries has been somewhat accelerated because of the inconsistency coming out of Washington. Well, yes, and uh, that's not surprising uh, uh, to me. I mean, if you're uh, a country in Southeast Asia and you're not quite sure where the United States stands, you sort of have a choice. You can play up to the, to the Chinese, or you can try to resist them by looking who are your friends in the neighborhood. And I think we see a little bit of that with Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I think we certainly uh, have seen that with, uh, with Japan. Right. Um, you know, Abe is uh, one who, you know, even 10 years ago, was looking for the kind of... Uh, 
international structure that would be a, a counterweight to the increasingly uh, aggressive uh, Chinese actions, uh, not just in the South China Sea, but in the in the uh, East China Sea and against you know the Some Japanese conquers. islands mm. and, and that type of thing. Um, so I think I think it's natural, and I I think the uh, America First policy leaves a lot to interpretation, and not all of it, which is comforting to right, to right, other countries. Right, right. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Philippines and uh, President Duterte, as you suggested, perhaps has been bought off by the Chinese. But I also look at South Korea, and I wonder if that relationship uh, has meandered a bit. Well, yes, I, I think it has. I mean, uh, clearly the, the threat from North Korea with its nuclear uh, tests and its missile firings has unnerved uh, the South. And clearly, President Moon, or I think anybody who would be president of South Korea, would be willing to go a long way to avoid a war that would be absolutely devastating uh, to Seoul and, and South Korea. Uh, so you can understand that. And the tough talk from Washington hasn't always accorded with what is, I think, a, a softer, more conciliatory approach from, uh, from Seoul. Uh, you know, that being said, uh, there comes a point, as we well know, that you can't be, uh, say, conceding to a threatening nation uh, forever. And I think, you know, that clearly is the lesson after, uh, you know, uh, Chamberlain in, in Europe and, and, you know, the fact that that was sort of the end of, of everything and, and it led to war within a year's time. Uh, so, you know, the, the problem, I think, that we face on the, on the Korean Peninsula uh, is a South Korea that definitely does not want a war, uh, some uncertainty as to whether the current administration in the United States is willing to go to war, even preemptively. Uh, and, you know, that's a different point of view. Right. Now, uh, one wonders, too, just how successful the Chinese have been in weaning Korea away from South Korea, away from the United States, and how much of a wedge factor that China has been? Well, you know, economically, uh, South Korea looks to China as a, as a major market, and, and that's quite natural. Uh, you know, the Chinese are superb at using their economic power and, and other things as a political uh, lever. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> of course, the United States has done that for decades, right. as, has, you know, as did the British when they had the empire and, you know, any empire uh, beforehand uh, did. So that's, uh, it's not a surprising uh, development. But I think the, real, the, the fundamental issue with, with South Korea is one of trying to avoid hostilities. Mm. Interesting, really interesting. Um, well, Xi Jinping, uh, has been very prominently mentioned in the news this week, given that the National uh, People's Congress has been in session and approved uh, an amendment to the Constitution, which, uh, according to everybody's view, will clear the way for him to be in power forever and ever, sort of a la Putin. What's your take on that? Well, it's interesting. Clear, you know, clearly he has interests in remaining beyond what the uh, uh, the previous Chinese law would have, uh, would have permitted, uh, it's not surprising. Uh, autocrats always like to stay in power. Of course, in some countries, non-autocrats, like congressmen, also like to stay in power. <laughs> uh, but uh, that notwithstanding, uh, I think it remains to be seen uh, whether he'll be successful in that in the long term, maybe in the short term, maybe in you know a few years beyond what is his uh, term in office. Uh, but developments in China could change. Mm. And uh, there are a lot of internal pressures in China, particularly economic and social, between the very wealthy cities, uh, basically along uh, the seacoast, and, uh, and the interior, where there's you know, a massive population that doesn't really share to the same uh, degree uh, the wealth along the coast. And there's an interesting thing in the longer term that could really affect that, and that's climate change. Because if you look at sea level rise and the projections that uh, can come between, shall we say, one meter and three meters over the next you know, 
30, 40, 50 years, that's going to flood a lot of China's coastal areas. And climate change also has a tremendous impact on habitability. And heat temperature rise will affect China very significantly. And it'll also affect <coughs> the food supply, mm. both the ability to grow things uh, on the land, but also with the acidification of the ocean, what it may do to the ability to, uh, to harvest uh, fish, upon which the Chinese population is far more dependent than just about any other uh, major power in the world. And uh, I think that's one of the underlying reasons why the Chinese have reached out into the South China Sea to make it their own economic zone. And, and, and that's a very interesting point of view that you raise. And, and also, it seems that the Chinese are, perhaps surprisingly, but again, maybe not so surprisingly, very strong proponents of the climate change treaty, the Paris climate change. I think they recognize the danger. Uh, they certainly have seen the danger from air pollution. If you look back a couple of years ago, and they, and I've forgotten, I think they called it the smog, smog apocalypse in Beijing. But uh, there was uh, one report I read at one point that said, you know, a third of all deaths uh, in the major cities there could be attributed to air pollution. And uh, I hadn't yeah. heard that. Statistic. Well, I, I, I can't, con I can't confirm that. But the fact that there was a study that uh, that alleged that tells you that, you know, it's a serious problem. Wow, that is really, really interesting. Well, um, OK, if Xi Jinping does stay in power beyond, you know, his, you know, uh, 10 years, what, what do you think will be the effect on America's position in well, I think he's he's certainly you know pushing to weaken America relatively to uh, uh, to China, you know the Great Road Initiative that they have, uh, which really has tremendous economic implications, but also has political military implications sure. because you know armies travel over roads as as well as traders, so uh, <laughs> you know if if you build it for traders, but the armies may come. Uh, you know, th that is a very long-term, probably century-long vision uh, of China, of how it can make itself uh, a true center, if not the center uh, of, of power in the world. And they think in terms like that. Right, we, right. You know, we still think in terms of, you know, quarterly profit statements, which doesn't always allow us to... Uh, shall I say, get our arms around a strategy that's going to be particularly effective. We seem to be having a lot of trouble getting our arms around a strategy right now. So let, let's take a break right here. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Uh, my guest today is Peter Olison. Uh, Peter has 48 years of experience in intelligent matters, intelligence matters. He worked in the Pentagon. He worked for the CIA. And uh, he's really uh, been giving us some really interesting things to think about. So don't go away, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, And every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, 1 o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And see you then. Aloha, I'm Richard Concepcion, the host of Hispanic Hawaii. You can watch my show every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. We will bring you entertainment, educational, and also we tell you what is happening right here within our community. Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host on Think Tech Hawaii of Pacific Partnerships in Education. Every other Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m., I hope you'll join us as we explore the value, the accomplishments, and the challenges of education here in the Pacific Islands. Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is Peter Olison. Uh, Peter is a former Pentagon and CIA intelligence specialist, analyst, and consultant. 
Uh, we've been uh, talking about uh, America's position in Asia. And uh, we were just talking about Xi Jinping and his, uh, uh, apparently he's going to stay in power forever and ever, uh, a la Putin. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about the uh, possible ramifications of that. But on the other hand, um, I wonder if Xi Jinping will be assassinated. Well, there's a long history of, shall I say, uh, violent departure from high office in Chinese history. So this is the it, essence of the romance of the three kingdoms. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, those things are you know very hard to predict. Uh, but uh, I would not be surprised. Uh, I think it could be terribly destabilizing, uh, and therein might lie the, the real reason to say you don't want to see that happen. Uh, it's not clear to me that there is an alternate power structure uh, in China, and were that not to be, and there was the subsequent struggle, uh, it could have major implications for the stability in the country and international trade. Uh, economics and, and even military action. I see what you're saying. Uh, I mean, it would certainly create instability, at least for a period Tremendous. of time. And, and who wants an unstable China? I don't think anybody wants an unstable <laughs> China. I think people would I like agree. to see China, you know, evolve to be more a, a member of the, shall I say, the, the, the liberal coalition of, of nations, liberal meaning that you you believe in resolving issues uh, through diplomacy and international uh, bargaining and that type of thing, and not by, by the use of force. Uh, you know, but China uses a bit of both. Uh, clearly, what we've seen in the South China Sea is uh, a bit of force. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, even some of the reported movements of Chinese forces to the North Korean border is a signal to Pyongyang to maybe cool it a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also think it's very defensive on the part of the Chinese, who probably are worried about mass migration out of North Korea if things start to, you know, to go badly. And they don't want to have to absorb a, a mass migration of, of Koreans. That's a really interesting comment, because it seems to me that a lot of, if there was a major turmoil in North Korea, yeah, there would be some people who will want to rush into China, but there will also be a lot of people who will want to rush into the South. Well, yeah, the, the question is, what would block you going either way? And, and if things were really going badly and there was a military confrontation along the 38th parallel, rushing to the South may be a little difficult. No, rushing, sure. rushing to the North might be the easier path, right. even, even if it might be longer. Right, 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 right. There's always the possibility of, of rushing to Russia. Uh, that's true. And uh, it's, it's interesting, if you look at the population mix in the Russian Far East, uh, the Russians have a somewhat tenuous grip from a population perspective, you know, in the East. And it's not too long ago that there was conflict between Russia and China along the Amur River and Chinese claims to things that the Russians believe are theirs. Right, so, right. you know, th this, is, this is not set in concrete. That's, that's very, very interesting, because while China talks about protecting its sovereignty and we'd be willing to almost come to blows with Japan over the little islands called the Senkakus, what about that Russian Far East? I mean, that, you know, was part of the Manchu Empire, and by China's way of thinking, that should be part and parcel of China today. They tend to look the other way. Well, you know, remember that Russia is a major source of military equipment for them. It's a major source of energy. Uh, they are an ally in many respects in the international arena. Uh, it would be somewhat short-sighted uh, to, I, I think, uh, poke the Russian bear's nose and the, and the Chinese think in the long term. I discussed the same issue with a very prominent international relations specialist at Fudan University while I was there, and his comment was very amusing. You know, we never pick fights with people that we think are as strong as us or stronger. Yeah, <laughs> smart. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's so true. Plus, as you say, I mean, Russia is still supplies very sophisticated weapons to yeah. China. Well. Um, 
Okay. Um, the big news and everybody's talking about is this potential meeting between Trump and KGU, as it's become, beginning to be called in the press, uh, Kim Jong-un. So what do you think? Is it going to happen, or is this just uh, chitter-chatter? Or I, what you, I, what's your take? I have a big question mark in my mind. And it, it comes down to what prompted the, the invitation. Um, and on one hand, you can think of it that the sanctions were starting to hurt and that Kim needs to resolve the issue because it's hurting those who support him and his family dictatorship, which is what it is in the North. Mm -hmm. um, the other hand is it's all part of the charm offensive that we saw, you know, with starting with the Olympics and a way to drive a wedge between Seoul and, and Washington. Mm. I believe that the basic goal that Kim and his father and his grandfather had to re reunify Korea, uh, which is something they've never been able to do. You know, the grandfather started a war to do it. Uh, clearly, the, the, the son wasn't willing to do that, although he certainly undertook many provocations, mm -hmm. including you know, sending a team to try to assassinate uh, President Park uh, in, uh, in Seoul. Uh, and the son would love his place in history of having succeeded doing what his father and grandfather couldn't do. And I don't think that thought goes away. Uh, but in the short term, he's probably worried about his survival as, as leader, and so he may be taking a step back uh, in order to protect his position, but I don't think he's giving up his long-term goal. How do you read President Moon, the president of South Korea? I mean, he is said to have very pro-United uh, pro Korea uh, stance of view. He's very similar to the previous president with whom he was very close, President Roe. Um, is he being manipulated by KGU? Probably. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what Kim does. I mean, he, he manipulates everything. If you read his propaganda, you know, it, it's really quite remarkable. You know, he's the greatest person who's ever lived in the history of the world. And interestingly, even the propaganda today now calls him Marshall Kim, right. which I thought was an interesting uh, uh, change from dear leader. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it sends a message. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of interesting to see. So, you know, the old analogy of the carrot and the stick, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's got one in each hand, and we'll have to see which one he, he does. If there is another nuclear test, uh, if there is, I think, more testing of long-range uh, ballistic missiles uh, that might have the capability of, you know, hitting the United States, uh, then I think any kind of meeting uh, is, is, off. is off. However, my, my real concern is that we'll have a meeting and the U.S. will not be well prepared for, shall I say, the very sophisticated capabilities of the North Koreans in negotiations. <clears throat> and the problem you have to remember is that they have never lived up to any agreement that they've done. So, That's you know, being really clearly echoed in the press. Well, it, it's true. Yeah. I agree. Uh, and, and so it makes you, you know, go back to Ronald Reagan where he said, you know, trust but verify when we were doing uh, strategic arms talks uh, with uh, the, the Soviets. Uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. And the verification issue is always a tremendous sticking point. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem that we've had with Iran. It will be a problem that we'll have with North uh, Korea. It's a problem that we now have with Russia because Russia is violating the Intermediate Nuclear Force Agreement uh, with its new weapon systems and where they've placed them. And we really, you know, we can say hey, you know, you're violating it, but we haven't done anything about it. Um, getting back to President Moon, uh, you know, it seems that he is not particularly enamored with the United States. That he does have this very strong pro-unified Korea mm -hmm. stance. 
Korean nationalism, if you want to call it that. And I'm just not sure where the balance is with him. Well, you know, clearly he's a Korean. You know, the people north of the 38th parallel and the people south of the parallel are basically, you know, of the same origin. Uh, I think it's a very natural thing to believe that being together is a good thing. We certainly saw that in Germany with mm -hmm. the reunification after mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the wall came down. Uh, and I would think Moon would have uh, some reservations with the United States, particularly with this administration that frankly has you know, basically threatened preemptive action. And yet, when you look at the military structure in, in South Korea, it's a joint structure. Right. Uh, right. It's not a U.S. Army and a South Korean Army. Right. It's a joint army. Right. And uh, so, you know, I don't think he wants to be dragged into a conflict that right. he doesn't see as in his nation's interest. So uh, we talked about the possible assassination of Xi Jinping, and uh, I know that you've written a few articles about the mm -hmm. political assassination. What about KGU? Will he be assassinated? That, I think, is a higher probability than Xi in China. Uh, if things get bad enough in North Korea for those who are, shall I say, close to the center of power and feel their position slipping, uh, that may be possible. Mm, that would be really interesting. But again, I think you would have instability in the North. Sure. And uh, that may be of great concern, not just to us, mm -hmm. but I think to the Chinese, too. That's true. We only have one minute left, as I've just been informed. So let me quickly sn sneak in this question. Uh, I wish we had longer for this. But uh, um, what's the relative importance of Asia to the United States? Why is America in Asia? Well, I mean, historically, you know, we got into Asia as the result of the Spanish-American War. You know, in, in terms of being a power, we'd always been trading with Asia. I mean, go back to Perry and Japan and, and, and all that. Uh, and then after the First World War, of course, we picked up a number of island territories under the trusteeship of the League of Nations. And, and then, of course, with the Second World War, you know, became the dominant uh, power there. And, you know, with forces in Japan, forces in Korea, um, you know, we really had a major stake. I think our major stake now is economic because Asia is our biggest trading partner, far surpassing the EU or Europe. Uh, and uh, that's in Americans' interest. I mean, what can you buy that's not made in China, uh, you know, for day-to-day -day living? And we depend upon it, and they depend upon us. So the, the ties that bind are economic. Uh, the others worry me that they may break that. and. Uh, cause us problems. Great. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, I want to thank our guests for being with us today. I want to thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next week when my guest will be uh, Dr. Zhang Jing uh, and his wife, uh, Dr. Yu Jane Chun, uh, coming to us from Kaohsiung in Taiwan. We'll see you then.